Um, so as a digital systems librarian, I'm primarily responsible for figuring out what to do with all of our assets without a dam. And uh, what that looks like is a lot of open source applications like DSpace and Omeka. And with that, there comes a lot of customizations, a lot of stuff that we have to involve our IT department with, managing servers, managing SQL databases. There's no vendor that's helping us with any of that stuff. So it's a challenge. Our current effort to deploy an institutional-wide dam started in 2017. And I'm gonna talk a bit about our dam selection process and Iris is going to talk about our exciting work with museum entities and authority work. So when choose, oh, I was gonna talk a little bit about our museum. So our museum complex consists of 28 interconnected buildings, 45 exhibition halls, the Richard Gilder Graduate School, and the Hayden Planetarium. We were founded in 1869. Uh, the library was founded with the museum. It was written into our charter that there would be a museum and a library. And we're so much more than just an exhibition space. We have five scientific divisions that are actively doing research on site and on expedition. We have over 33 million specimens and one petabyte of data. And only 2% of our collections are ever on display at one time. So when deploying an institutional dam, why start with a library? Well, we're the museum's archive. So since our inception, the library has been acquiring collections from various departments. It gives us a bird's eye view of the assets and data across the institution. We're ideally situated to lead the effort for an inclusive museum-wide approach. And within the library, we've been making strides in digitizing our own collections. So we started kind of grappling what to do with our digital content since like 2005 with grant funded efforts um, that have kind of, I mean, they exist. <laughs> we have them, we have lots of legacy databases. In 2014, we decided to take the plunge and we deployed Omeka, which is a web publishing platform, open source. And it allowed us to provide access to digitized image derivatives and the metadata to the public and the staff. So we decided to go that route because it was open source and free. It was easy to deploy. And because we needed some kind of like way to demonstrate that cataloging and providing access to our images would add value to our institution. So it was kind of like, if we can show them that this is worthwhile, maybe they'll give us money for a dam. So that was in 2014. <laughs> and it's now 2019. <laughs> So as the library considered the best way forward, we determined the it was essential to partner with our IT department and our digital media departments. Um, our partnership resulted in a committee charged with identifying and interviewing stakeholders, documenting their workflow patterns, identifying pain points, summarizing our findings, and synthesizing high-level requirements. So identifying stakeholders. The first group that we chose um, they were, well, actually, let me backtrack. We identified stakeholders based on current and projected use of digital assets in their day-to-day -day workflows. 13 departments were interviewed over four weeks, so it was a really fast project when we decided to do it. Our first round of interviews focused on stakeholders involved in similar archive asset life, life cycles. Um, so we focused on people that were doing asset creation, archiving, repurposing to create new assets, and licensing work. And then our second round of interviews focused on getting a complete view of what a dam should encompass for science. So we interviewed stakeholders from anthropology, invertebrate zoology, paleontology, physical sciences, invertebrate zoology. So our stakeholder interviews focused on current workflows and technical requirements. So we basically asked them like what their typical day-to-day -day looked like when it came to digital assets. We asked them to identify the software, any systems that they were using, um, we asked them how they were generally creating assets or repurposing them and how those workflows were distinct. Um, we asked them how they typically searched for assets, which, which was <laughs> challenging for many of them. Um, we asked what information they used to search for a particular asset, which was usually close your eyes and hope. Um, we asked them to describe use cases with sharing assets in, with uh, non am &H entities and to describe what cross-departmental de use cases looked like. And we wanted to know what their pain points were. Uh, we tried to ascertain some of the technical requirements that we were looking at, so what kind of formats they were using, bandwidth requirements, 
asset size, delivery needs. We asked about metadata standards that were in use, if they were using any authority lists or taxonomies or controlled vocabularies. And we wanted to know what their current storage needs were and their projected five-year storage outlook. And what we found is that we were at great risk of losing our stuff. So museum scientific research and our legacy was at risk of being lost because we had no mechanism to centrally manage those assets and preserve them. We also found that nobody could find what they were looking for without a centralized place for storing the assets. Assets are like scattered around the institution. There's no metadata related to them. Naming conventions are irregular. So access was a really big pain point for people. We also um, found out that our content management system and our collections database could really benefit from having a dam at the institution. Um, it would add value and enhance the quality of our digital content by having a dam. Because in our content management system, people just upload images. They're named all sorts of ways. There's a lot of duplication. There's no like one picture of the blue whale or one picture of the T-Rex. There's several. So there's no way to like manage what we're putting out there. Um, collaboration. Uh, people had trouble uh, collaborating with each other because gathering assets and sharing them is a challenge for many of the staff at AMH. Um, innovation is very limited, and the museum is committed to using emerging technologies to promote scientific research. So we do a lot of work with apps. Um, I think if you've been to AMNH, you might have used our Explorer app that uses, leverages a lot of the assets that we have. We also do a lot with augmented reality and virtual reality. And being able to have access to the assets, uh, having them handy, having them searchable, makes this innovation a lot easier to um, and efficiency. So if people can't find stuff, they're not going to be very efficient. So even just having a centralized repository, attaching metadata to it, making it findable is going to make people more efficient. Also, we do license a lot of content, and we, so we give it away. We license it for exhibitions and stuff like that, but we have no way of managing any of those licenses. So uh, having a dam is just essential for us to do our jobs. So finally, we did get a list of broad requirements that we submitted to some vendors. So our approach was to basically send these very broad, high-level requirements and say, can you do this stuff? And if they said yes, we sent them more granular requirements. So the broad requirements were we needed a system that was file format agnostic to be able to scale from a TIFF to a CT scan. So we wanted something that could work for all those administrative departments, exhibitions, education, and also be able to scale to science if we needed it to. We needed the storage to be scalable because we would like to roll it out to other departments. We wanted it to have flexibility with metadata schemas if we had to extend metadata schemas. Um, it had to have a standards-based API. Um, we wanted it to integrate with our LDAP system. And we wanted something that was cloud-based. Uh, our IT department made it very clear that a cloud-based hosted solution was the way we were to go. So, and with that, we, we also have like a plan B <laughs> in place, just in case it doesn't go, go through. So we identified three strong candidates, and we used knowledge that we gained from the Henry Store Conference, and we gathered all of our assets to give to them, and we wrote a script, and we said, perform these tasks with our assets. And the things that we wanted to see performed were, uh, show us how you use controlled vocabularies. Show us how you integrate with external thesauri, like Getty and Library of Congress. Show us your OCR capabilities. Show us your full text searching. And our IT department and the digital media department were very interested in AI, so they were looking for uh, auto-tagging -tag capabilities and also auto-transcription. So our next steps are basically money. We want money. <laughs> so on the left, the, the screen grab over there is our Omeka system where we, have, we currently have about 50,000 50, images in there and there's about 20,000 that are available to the public to look at with great metadata from our metadata librarian over there. Um, so we're looking for money and we, we have a proposal in with our executive group about the dam that we would like to fund. 
Uh, we also are courting a vent, uh, funder. Um, we've been, while we're waiting for that, we're analyzing our metadata. And we are also advising external departments about best practices and data management so that when the time comes for them to archive their stuff with us, all the metadata is already there. So we do do a lot of outreach with that. And then we're going to wait for an agreement. And then we're going to wait for implementation. And then we're all going to dance. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to be awesome. Dance party. So now Iris is going to talk about the authorities we've been creating for AM and H entities. Take it away, Iris. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. You're welcome. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I don't, how much time do I have? I don't want to take it on too long. Oh, okay. Well, okay. I'll go through this. Um, so, I'm the cataloging and metadata librarian at the museum, and over the last few years, I've been working a lot with um, archives authorities in specifically. I mean, we have library authorities, um, but these are archives authorities. Um, these are names that of people and um, units, departmental units, and other units that are closely related to the museum. So how did we do this? Um, well, as a librarian, I love controlled lists. I'm not trying to recreate the wheel. If there are people that we have in our list of names, I'm going to go ahead and use the Library of Congress name authority, because that's one everyone else uses. <laughs> We're going to use that one. But we do have a lot of local names that we do need some control over um, for various reasons. So I think of our database as a hub of names that are central to the museum. Uh, so people, sorry, people. And expeditions. Expeditions are important because um, we get a lot of material back from expeditions. In fact, a lot of our science collections um, are gathered in the field and brought back. And uh, those are basically, they, they create our specimen collections or artifact collections. But they also record, um, they record things in the field as well. So field books, photographs, videos, those all come back as well. Um, when they do come back to the museum, they get spread out, distributed to their separate departments, and uh, they lose that initial provenance. So having a name, one, a single name for an expedition that all of our departments can use can help bring those materials together without dis disrupting where they live currently. Departments. This year, we uh, are celebrating our 150th birthday. And you can imagine that over 150 years, the department's names have changed over time. Um, some have come and gone. Others have merged and split. This is a very challenging set of names to uh, codify. So we're working on that. <laughs> it's a necessary one, because obviously, without our departments, we wouldn't have our research. So. It's important to have those names, and we're working on that. Permanent exhibitions. Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot to add that um, you see this ID prefix here. Um, we have assigned uh, unique identifiers to our categories of entities. So we have an alphanumeric prefix, which is the AM and H, C for corporate body, and then the underscore for whichever um, underscore and a number for whichever category it's re representing. And this has been really helpful for us in manipulating that data as a group or presenting it as a group. Sorry about that. So our public, ex uh, public exhibitions, um, our permanent exhibitions, probably what we're most known for. Um, but those names have changed a lot over time, too. <laughs> and then temporary exhibitions, which are probably my favorite, because they don't last very long, so they don't shake. <laughs> that much. <laughs> you get one name and it's on for like six months. Yay, done. <laughs> so as I was saying, we are looking for one preferred name to assign to all of our assets 
And how do you do that when it's been called so many different things over the years? Um, this is just one example uh, for the Hall of Asian Mammals. We ended up choosing the most current name. This is the name that we currently use. And outside of our institution, we preface it with our institution name. And then the hall would be the subfield. Um, we do have all this data in a database. In structured, um, the data is structured in a schema called EACCPF. Um, I won't go into that, <laughs> just so you know. Um, and the schema does, um, it does support variant names. So here is an example of that hall with all of its variant names. Um, we've listed the years in which those names were associated um, and also said, this is an uncontrolled form, so don't use that. <laughs> but if someone were looking for, say, the Vernet Fonthorp Hall of Asian Mammals, they would be led to this record, and they can see the preferred name at the top of the page. Um, another thing that our authority records provide is context. Um, in, author or in archives work, context is really important to understanding the materials that you have at hand. So um, we try to provide using, um, using some research of our museum publications, we provide some basic information about the hall or the entity. This happens to be about the hall. So where does that leave us? Um, I mean, a lot of this work is still in progress. Um, however, it's been very useful and Basically, I mean, doing this allows us to pretty confidently tag um, or assign a controlled name to these entities. Um, and then just, you know, kind of stepping back from that, I mean, really what we're talking about is assets in databases. Um, in the library, we are siloed. We have lots of different databases that, um, that contain different types of formats. We need them to be separate. But, but you know, how are they going to talk to each other? So using controlled names is a great way to bridge those gaps and to, um, pretty, I mean, to break down the silos a bit. So basically, if things are um, tagged correctly, if they are sharing the same vocabulary, then in essence, our different systems can talk to each other through that, sim that same language. So I'm going to show you a really exciting part of our authority records, which are relationships. And um, really, I guess this is where our repository of relationships really is, um, at the hub of these entity records. Um, within our entity descriptions, we also list people and expeditions, events, um, related to the entity that we're describing. And this is all in structured data as well. So back to the Hall of Asian Mammals, this is only a few um, of the people and expeditions related, but you can see that this brings a lot of value to um, the authority work that we're doing. And in the database, these are linked. So what does that mean? It means that we can create a network of relations, which is very, very, very exciting for us. Um, this here is um, an early, pro like a proof of concept visualization that I just put together. So forgive me, it's like pretty <laughs> basic. But the idea is that, you know, with, with all of this data being created and being structured and being codified, it's then, you know, we're at this stage where we can have some really nice visualizations of our data and how people are related to, say, halls or um, who went on expedition. What did they bring back? Did they, you know, did it go into a hall? Um, these are things that are really kind of great uh, discovery tools for us. So we're excited about that. And. That's it, and we, have, um, we do have a, 
some people working in science visualization who they've started to use our data to create visualizations, which is very exciting. I wish I um, was able to share that with you here today, but um, but it's it's great that we can we can look towards that, and uh, we're hoping that using using taxonomy, using vocabularies as a way to control our assets will be a great next step into going into a dam uh, because I think the better the metadata is going in, the more relationships that we can discover.